Hey, what's going on, guys? Welcome back to the Phil Craft Survival Podcast. I am joined by a very special guest today. Mac, thanks for being on the podcast, man. Thanks for having me, Mike. Yeah, we're doing video, so it's I usually tune my conversation for audio and not overly concerned with video. But there's a reason specifically that we wanted to capture this on video, uh, especially because it has to do with historical references and a beautiful art medium. Um, Mac is an artist, the owner of Prairie Fire Art Company. Um, Prairie Fire, I've known for years, kind of building and doing things in the background and got in touch with Mac over the course of the last year and identified that Mac was an actual Green Beret who was doing amazing artwork of Green Berets and other special operations guys. Um, today we're going to talk about his art, we're going to talk about his life, and we're going to talk about the piece that's sitting behind us, which is super significant and personal to me. So, Mac, you just came out and I almost think it was hesitancy of you even letting me know that you're a Green Beret. And um, that's for good reason, because we don't like to, we don't need to over advertise that. Um, why was that a part of your, why was that important to you? Well, Mike, I've been an artist for many years. Um, and I've always loved uh, the military, military history, uh, our nation, our warriors in general, and uh, telling stories about them has always been something I'm very passionate about. So as an artist, though, I also think it's important to know what you paint uh, or write or film, right? And certainly those who have um, touched their subject up close uh, have more authenticity. And it was very important to me that I have authenticity in my work um, because of the significance of my subject matter uh, being military art. So uh, for that and many other reasons, you know, I uh, had my time uh, in active duty military, um, benefited tremendously from the experience, and uh, just cultivated a true love for the Special Forces Regiment, the soft community uh, in general, and of course, you know, the military community as a whole, uh, our war fighters and uh, what they've accomplished, uh, men and women like yourself, over the last you know, 20 years and stretching back into the Cold War and beyond uh, is incredible. And there's incredible stories uh, to tell. And so for me to paint those stories was so significant, so important that I really think I benefited from spending time, um, you know, with a rock on my back, uh, uh, meeting and learning from just true war heroes, uh, spending time with guys with tremendous experience. Uh, it, I think, is now um, even more so than in the past, breathing life into my art, and, and I hope authenticity. And that's, you know, really how we started talking was about this project. Mm. Um, you know, it's, like you said, it's been about a year since we first uh, touched base on it, and. Um, it is, in a sense, a microcosm of my mission as a whole to, to sit down with someone who has done incredible things and uh, capture a story that's very important to them uh, in a fine art painting and then bring that painting to um, the country as a whole, to, to people everywhere, so that they can um, uh, be reminded of that story daily, whether the painting hangs in their home, their office, they see it online. Uh, it's a way to communicate something we don't have photographs of. Yeah, I find it real interesting, man, because you remind me of Jack Carr. I mean, uh, you're like the artist Jack Carr, because I think the reason why Terminal List is so successful, and I'd never read fiction until I read Jack Carr, because I just don't like fiction. Um, but when you read the story and all of the details are so specific and real, as somebody who has that experience, you find it offensive if it's not closely related to the truth. Right, yeah. And it's so closely related that he could tell it so 
different than a Tom Clancy. Um, and I think that's the power in it. I mean, that's why I think in popular uh, mediums, it's become this thing. You know, Chris Pratt p playing it, about to be released in July, uh, the terminal list on, I believe, Amazon Prime. So it, it is super significant, but it's also more meaningful. And when you look at even the paintings behind us, that story of how you tell it based on your experience is super unique. I, I don't think, you know, I've never seen Dietz do that, right? You know, uh, I've never seen Tom Clancy do that. You don't even know who they are or who, what they look like. But I think it's cool that you're just tying all those things together. And it makes sense now looking back and reflecting on the accuracy and details of every single painting that I've seen of yours in print. How beautiful it is, man! I, I think it's really cool. Where did where did you where, where did art come from in your family? Where, where did this come from? Well, it really came from my love of the subject matter, you know. And so, as a little kid, I was drawing and coloring, right, like everybody does. Um, and I just didn't stop. I just kept doing it. Uh, I got better over time. Um, you know, pretty much entirely self-taught. Uh, I have studied the works of masters, and that has been uh, my art school. Uh, for the most part, uh, has been able to you know, sit down with amazing paintings um, and study them and read about the artist's process and learn about you know, their tricks of the trade, et cetera. And this then, is on your own. Yeah, yeah. This and then over academic, the years, so. yeah, growing up, and then taking that and then just slowly over time you know, incorporating that into my own process and owning it and experimenting and figuring out what works for me. Um, so that's happened over the years. Um, and then, you know, I would say it's probably been in the last uh, five, six years, you know, that I really started to uh, translate that into art done for other people, you know, or other uh, entities, um, and started to kind of create something that I could bring to people at scale. Uh, so that's kind of where, you know, we get to today, where, you know, we sell our prints and, and have a way to, you know, do commissions and start to tell stories for people, you know, everywhere. It's incredible because I compare you to Dietz I grew up with Dietz, um, it's James Dietz, yes. I believe. Yep. Um, the first Dietz print I bought was after Ranger School um, during graduation. And we had the opportunity to buy prints. Mm -hmm. Everybody buys Ranger license plates and all kinds of stickers, unless you're in battalion, because if you're in battalion, Ranger battalion, you'll just get haze for doing something like sure. that. Sure. But um, we, we would set everything, um, up for you know be, building this esprit de corps on, on this uh, collective suffering that you did and you want something to remember it by and so I had a, a, a ranger portrait print from um, World War II mm -hmm. which was a famous uh, picture and that's gone up in value but it was super historically important but personally important and what I love about what you're doing is you don't need to be part of that specific experience to enjoy the art, right? And and I think that's, like Dietz is in the Airborne and Special Operations Museum, but I don't see it mainstream. I think every American should be hanging this in, in, in every room in their in their home because it could, it could be, it is in our community um, part of history, but it could be part of an American's telling of the stories in history through through the way that you communicate it. I think that's that's what's super cool about it, and I'm surprised. And maybe that's like the best, or that way. I'm surprised to hear that you never went to like uh, an art school. Um, what what did you do for a living before you were in special forces? So you know, I was a corporate guy for years. You know, mm -hmm. just sort of regular jobs in the city. Um, learned a lot. Met a lot of great New York people. City? Now the Boston area. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, cool place. You know, great stories. Awesome people. Um, always kind of did art on the side, you know, and you talk about Dietz. I mean, uh, Jim is an awesome guy and he's been... Did you meet him before? Uh, yeah, so we, we stay in contact from time to time oh, and cool. I'll show him, you know, my latest art that I'm working on whenever. He's been so helpful, so kind. Really cool. Yeah, great guy. Um, Don Trioni is another one. Uh, some of your fans may actually uh, recognize his name. Mm. Um, he's a little more obscure than Dietz because he's focused on uh, Civil War history, Revolutionary War history but a phenomenal artist and I learned a lot from him. I've actually uh, 
been a subject uh, uh, posing for many of his paintings. So like in his paintings in different places, you know. Oh, cool. Uh, it's kind of cool. But yeah, those guys have been like mentors um, in ways big and small that have really helped me develop as an artist. And then also too, there's a lot of history behind even military history art. So, uh, you know, Triani, guys like him, they look back to the French masters who interestingly enough were veterans of French wars and they came back from those wars and they painted their wars and they, they painted their wars not just, as you said, not just for their fellow veterans, but they painted them for their nation, right? They painted them for their people hmm. to remember these significant events that not only shaped the lives of the military community, but ultimately shaped the story of the nation as a whole. And that is, of course, very true for America, right? I mean, and countries, our allies around the world, same thing, you know? I mean, these conflicts that have been waged have shaped the national identity in very significant ways. And so that's why, yes, this series that we're kicking off here um, is uh, special for that reason. It's, it's showing something that is very personal to your story that we're gonna talk about, right? But it's not just for guys who were there at that moment. It's like you said, it's for everybody to learn from, to look at, to remind, and to show honor to something that's important for our nation's history. What is, what is the satisfaction you get from art, from making art or, or um, running a business centered around art? What, what is it that drives you? It's the stories. Mm. You know, this is your story. Yeah. And that's what drove me with this painting. You know, every minute I'm working on it, regardless of the stage of the process, I'm motivated by the significance of your story. You know, I want to tell your story well, and I want to tell it in a way that inspires people uh, and motivates people onto, you know, similar acts of greatness in their life, whatever their context, right? Yeah. Uh, that reminds them of what our nation has done as a whole over the years, or reminds them of our community uh, and what it means to the country and what it means to them. So, you know, when I'm starting the process, as you know, you know, how did we start on this? We started with a conversation. We talked about your, your career. We talked about your experiences. And then I take that and we talk about a specific moment. I take that and I do a sketch. You know, it's an initial concept sketch. So I figure out kind of generally where I want to place figures, what, what it should look like, how to make the scene work. And then we talk about it, you know, is it realistic? Do I have guys in the right places? Do I, is the building look right? You know, I mean, what, you know, do we have a good feel here? Mm. Then I go from there and I accumulate enough um, gear, uh, uniforms, equipment, uh, whatever it is. If the subject's military, it's going to be uniforms. If it's not military, it's whatever the material culture is that was used in that moment. And then I take that and I put that on models, like living human beings who I pose in um, uh, reference poses that match my sketch. And so I start to begin to visually create the little world, the vignette that I'm going to paint. And then that helps me get the shadows, uh, the lighting, the color, uh, details correct. That gives me a good starting point. And that's where I go into a detailed drawing. So I sit down, I look at all those different pictures, and I compile them into a drawing um, on paper. Mm. And then I take that drawing, and I um, begin the painting process. So I put that drawing on my canvas, and that's when the painting starts to come to life. And I'll tell you, the coolest part um, is right at the beginning, the middle, and, the, and of course the end. But you start to see it take life. You know, life is breathed into the painting, and it starts to be something. And that's the coolest part. And then I love showing it. Like, you know, I remember the moment I sent you the first, you know, image of it. It's a great reveal to say, hey, check it out. Like, here is that story coming to life in a painting. Hmm. It's so interesting because it's, I mean, most artists don't tell their process in the first place. But what I love about it is it's not just taking a photo yeah. and imposing it and then tracing it, essentially. It's taking the story first, articulating the story through the imagery, yeah. and then painting it. What, what do you use for paint? Is it oil on canvas? or? Yeah, so I paint uh, large paintings like this in oil. I also have uh, a series of uh, individual units and figures that I, uh, I'm documenting. It's a big project. I'm trying to document um, important units from our military community uh, in America and in abroad, uh, international partners, um, specifically through the GWAT. So I'm working my way through the GWAT. 
and I want eventually to have something for everybody, yeah. right? Uh, there's something that honors everyone. And then moving my way back through the Cold War into World War II, creating a visual history, a record of the fighting men and women of the United States and, uh, and abroad, our partners. Um, then I'm doing these big paintings, right? And that's really where my main effort is, is one story after another, telling an important story, uh, military or otherwise. And uh, that's how we got to this. But that's all in oil. The smaller pieces are all in uh, with the gouache. It's like a watercolor. Uh, it activates with water, but it's uh, a little thicker and easier to use than watercolor. How do you pull a print? Because, I, I mean, I love, like Dietz is, was incredible because you can get that print based off the painting. Yeah. And then the one I have from uh, Ranger School, it had the veterans of that battle signed on the bottom of the print. Do you pull it by a picture? Like, what's the process for that? Yeah, so there's a couple different ways you can do it. Um, the imaging usually happens either via a very high resolution scan, or you take a very high resolution photograph and you get the lighting to sort of make sure you balance all the colors. After the fact, there's always a digital color correction that has to go on. Mm. So there's a lot of actually post-production editing that happens to match what you capture digitally with what you have in front of you. Um, as the actual piece of art. Uh, once you have that done, you have uh, a print that you can, you know, put out in different sizes or what have you. What's the first, what, what is the first time that you realized, I mean, it, you know, being a Green Beret is a, a thing. It's like a job, it's a commitment. But a lot of Green Berets that I grew up with in the military had a creative outlet. They played guitar, mm -hmm. they wrote poetry, they drew, they painted, they had something that was like an outlet for them outside of their Green Beret profession. When did you realize, hey, uh, this is what I'm gonna do with my life? Yeah, I think it was back when, I think one of the earliest moments was when I was back actually at Bragg. And you know, you remember, right? Like you have all the street names are named after like true war heroes, you know, Medal of Honor uh, awardees from, you know, Vietnam or McAfee Sog. Or, mm. You know, people come there and speak, whether it's, Sergeant Major Billy Waugh, right? Mm -hmm. Or John Stryker Meyer. I mean, these, these incredible figures from the history of the regiment come and, and they speak to the, the guys there, uh, whether it's students or whether, you know, active duty guys or whatever. And um, it's a really cool thing. I mean, it's sobering. Uh, the other thing you have is your walls of honor, right? Like you walk by them. I'm sure you had it in your schoolhouse, right? Yeah. Um, the pictures are on the wall. You walk by the guys who uh, didn't come back. And you do that every day, multiple times a day, and you stop and you have conversations with your peers and you share stories that one person may have of those guys. And you know, me just coming away from that and then starting to realize that stories could translate for me into art and I could actually tell the story of the regiment um, and not just the SF regiment, but the, the soft community and, and, and beyond as a whole. I don't know. It's a, it's a responsibility. Like I don't know how I couldn't do it, right? Um, because uh, it's important. You know, I was talking to John Stryker Meyer, good friend, great guy, right? And uh, we were talking about a Matt specific, guy. yeah, Max Sog, exactly. Yeah. And we were talking about um, uh, one of his uh, specific missions, right? And I was like, John, I, I got to do a painting on this. I have to. Like, we have to tell this. Like, you don't have photos of this moment because you were kind of busy with other stuff, right? <laughs> you know? yeah. And he's like, yeah. I was like, we got to capture this. You know what I mean? Um, Ooh, I, feel, cool. I feel compelled to, to capture those moments because I, I can, and therefore, you know, they're so important, like, I should. Like, it's a responsibility. So I feel a responsibility to tell these stories and to tell them well um, for posterity, for the future, uh, to capture the past, to capture the present for the future. But, um, but I think it really started to kind of come together for me, you know, back when I was there, you know, seeing those street names and those photos and just being reminded of the significance around every corner. I mean, you, you walk in the footsteps of those giants. And, you know, for me back then, I remember I was, I was nothing, you know, I was, I was nobody. Um, but I was constantly walking in their footsteps. And it's so inspiring, you know. To, so that's really where it came from. Yeah, I know there's a lot a lot of things are missed by people because they, there's not provided context, right? Because you have the names of streets, you have prints, you have uh, all these references throughout history 
but there's no context behind who was the guy the street was named after. Um, who is the guys that are fighting a battle in the print? What I love about social media, one of the benefits of it, is the ability to storytell and use different formats. You know, whether it's podcast or um, whether it's you know using a QR code to, to show the video reference for for something. I, I think all of that tie-in, especially for Americans now who need that kind of engagement it's so much more impactful. Like mm -hmm. I, I, I have prints from Dietz, including the guts to try from um, the Iranian hostage situation that started JSOC because mm -hmm. of the result. And I wish I knew all of the details. I wish there was a podcast. I wish there was a video. I wish I could see the faces of those warriors tell their story. So it's super cool that you're able to tie all these things in together and then get a print that you can hang on your wall, which is why, I mean, I, I started collecting art when I was 20 years old, 19 years old, actually, um, in, out of Rainer School, because I went, huh, I could have something cool that's a reminder of my experiences, but as a storytelling piece. I mean, it's like the Eagles and Angels hat, right? Yeah. Uh, my favorite thing about those hats is the story that you could tell at the dinner table when someone's like, well, so what, what, tell me what's up with that hat? Like, oh, I didn't just buy this at Walmart. There's a story behind it. You know? Yeah, exactly. Um, when you kind of transition into focusing on this as a business and got away from the corporate gig, was that really satisfying for you? Because my, my fear has always been, like in photography, I love photography. When you make it a job, it becomes that and you kind of lose some things in that. What, what's your take on that? I mean, I think that's a great point. And certainly to some extent, when you make something your main effort, um, there is a lot that comes with that, right? There's uh, increased burdens, increased responsibilities, right? I mean, I've, I've got kids, right? I mean, you know what it's like, right? I mean, it, it, you, you, there's a certain amount of uh, targets that you have to hit, right? Um, but I find it incredibly freeing at the same time. I mean, you're able to drive exactly what you want to accomplish and, uh, and learn from your mistakes. Um, and I think that's huge, you know. Um, my wife, I, I, I know I've definitely stressed her out with, you know, my, uh, my comfortability with failing because I know I can learn from a failure, you know what I mean? Even if it's something as small as like a piece of art that I chose to create that just didn't work out right, you know? Mm. Um, I know I learned something from that, yeah. right? They don't and call that. it starving artists for nothing. Exactly. <laughs> That's why, yeah. And uh, so I've been very fortunate and very blessed to have just a tremendous base of support, you know, guys like you uh, who have been so supportive uh, as I uh, developed uh, this art and, you know, have brought it to the point where it is now. Um, so I'm really excited about, you know, where it's going. It's, it's cool. Um, but I think, yeah, it's been great to be able to, to focus on it to be um, immersed in the community itself as well, and to constantly be talking about ideas and connecting with uh, different people about stories they'd like to see. And the feedback from uh, you know, everyone who is supporting my work has been incredible. You know, I, I, I love getting the DMs from, from people who are like, hey, I just want to show you this picture of me. I was there uh, you know, during the time of that painting that you just mm -hmm. put out. Like, this means a lot to me. Um, I love it when they notice details that I, you know, got um, uh, right in the painting, you know, like, hey, man, like, that pattern of camouflage, like, that's exactly what we were wearing, you know, How, how'd you get that? You know what I mean? Like, that means something to me. Mm. Um, so it's little stuff like that. That feedback has been so rewarding. And the, the opportunity to create these stories uh, one after the other is, is, uh, is what drives me. So, yeah, I've been really fortunate to be able to work on it. So let's talk about the the painting behind me. It, this is uh, a template in how we tell this of kind of how this process works. Mm. You have, what's the dimensions on this? This thing's huge. Yeah, it's huge. So the, the actual painting itself is uh, roughly 36 inches by 48 inches. And then of course the frame adds to that, but it's a big piece. So when you are looking at, we're, we're, we're storytelling for this particular piece, um, 
that's a lot of pressure for like getting it, potentially getting something wrong. Before you go to Canvas, I assume you have flushed out every single potential chance of there being an error and then you're committed full, full in, right? Yeah, 100%, like yeah, absolutely. So huh. not only do yeah. I have all those photographic references, but it's very common to do a small color study and just kind of figure out really quickly, roughly, how are the colors gonna interact? And if you need to make a change, experiment with it there before you start putting it on the canvas. But even then, I mean, inevitably, there's that moment where you say, oh no, like this is not the right shade and I've gotta wait for it to dry and then, you know, adjust it or I've got to blend something in now. So there's there's moments when you realize you have, you know, four hours to fix it and that's it, you know, or something like that. Uh, and and um, <clears throat> I know you have the Prairie Fire podcast where we, we talk specifically about this piece, but how did this process start for Philcraft listeners? How did the yeah. how did how did this begin? Yeah. Well so uh, everybody who follows you, right, on social uh, and, and otherwise, um, should be familiar at this point with a lot of the photos you've posted of, of your, your time uh, in Special Forces. Uh, and specifically, you know, I noticed the stuff about you uh, in Iraq around you know, 2006, 2007, 2008, right? Working with um, Iraqi partners, uh, ICTF, others, ISOF in general, right? And there was just something about that story that was so impactful for me. I was having a conversation with uh, another gentleman who had a lot of experience from that time frame and beyond um, working with some of the same partners, right? And I asked him just out of curiosity, you know, because I'm a, I'm a nerd about this stuff like anybody else, right? I said, hey, you know, like, who was your favorite partner for us? Like, who do you think were, you know, some of the best you ever worked with? And this guy had a lot of experience, right? Uh, and he said, I was expecting him to say, you know, a unit that like maybe I was like super familiar with before I, you know, and this conversation was before I even knew more about, you know, the different partners. And I expected something like, you know, I don't know, he was gonna tell me, you know, the Brits or something like that, right? And uh, he said, 100% uh, ICTF. And I said, okay, why? And he said, you can have all the best training, all the coolest equipment, all the latest technology, but nothing matches experience. And when you have been at prolonged war, like those guys have been, time after time, mission after mission after mission. You just, it's hard to, it's hard to match that. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. That experience. That really stuck with me. And so as I was looking at your stuff, that was the same thing that kind of, of course, you know, as we talk about, um, you know, your experiences in your career, it's the same thing, right? Like it's, it's experience that you, you can't match easily, right? You know what I mean? And that's something I think is really important for people to realize about um, the GWAC community is that, you know, we're talking about America's longest war. I mean, there are people, veterans who have come out of this conflict who have more experience war fighting than, you know, it's like on par with like the ancient Spartans, you know, yeah. where their whole lifetime was war, you know what I mean? And so I wanted to capture in a painting that experience and I wanted to capture a specific moment that was uh, special to you uh, because as my friend, it was important to me to tell part of your story, right? Mm. And so that's kind of where I started to think about, hey, well, what should we, what story should we tell? What moment should we capture? And I think there's many more moments that, you know, we can paint in the future and capture, right? But this was one to start with for sure. It was super important to me. I knew it was important to you from our, con our first conversations. And so it just became a passion project to tell the story well, to show also as well the brotherhood of the United States and uh, the ISOF guys. You know what I mean? Yeah. To show something, to show a cross-cultural love and connection, you know, bonded and forged by war. Um, that is something I think a lot of Americans can easily forget about. Right? Yeah. You know, I, our partner forces, another guy told me it is a really good point to not forget, like, those guys have been doing the bulk of the fighting and dying and bleeding in the war against uh, Islamic terrorists in the Middle East for a while. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so I wanted to honor them too. I didn't want them to be in this painting uh, a sideshow to like, you know, Green Berets. I wanted it to be both. I wanted to show them together in the stack, you know, flowing into the target uh, as one team mm. in one fight. Yeah, the, this is the first painting and subsequent prints for the Strength and Honor series. And when I think about this specific uh, painting in them entering together through the breach point, 
Why did you capture that specific moment out of all the things that you could have captured in action? Why that? I think it's the risk of the unknown. You know, I think it's it's analogous to when you jump out of an airplane, right? You know, whether it's a static line or free fall. I mean, there's that moment um, where I think even if you've had thousands of jumps, there's still that moment where you're like, I don't really know exactly what's going to happen here. You know, there's there's just there's inherent obvious risk in your activity, and you have to make that decision to cross that threshold and just go for it, Yeah. right? You know, mm -hmm. it's kind of like that quote, I think why uh, General Gavin from World War II in the 82nd War, he said, show me a man who will jump and I'll show you a man who will fight, right? Mm -hmm. It's just, there's something about it. it. It just, it kind of captures that about someone. And I think that going through the breach point is similar to that, right? Pushing into that moment, it's like, there's that threshold you're crossing where you're still in danger, right? Right. And, but you, as you cross that threshold, you're entering into an unknown situation that has tremendous risk. Mm. And so I wanted to show this brotherhood of this team doing that at that exact moment. And I wanted to show them doing it together. And I wanted to show a sort of uh, relentless energy in the team as they push into this mission. Because mm. I think that's something that really captures uh, what you guys were doing over there, as we talked about it, you know, uh, as a whole, it captures the, the, the relentless mission that you guys were on to hunt down the bad guys and neutralize threats. Mm. And it was something I think a lot of guys, too, forget, like nowadays. Like, I'll talk to people nowadays, and, you know, people are kind of thinking about, like, the latest gear and the latest, like, cool guy stuff or whatever, right? But you guys, your op tempo was so, you know, vicious uh, during that time frame. It was night after night after night, right? Mm -hmm. Just multiple hits, constantly rolling on to follow on targets, et cetera. So I wanted to capture something that really showed uh, the intensity of the moment. And mm -hmm. I felt like showing the breach point was the right way to do that. I love that. Yeah, it's, we call it counterterrorism, foreign internal defense, CT FID, because, you know, when you're operating in both by, with, and through, which is, you know, the, the rapport building of building a partner force, training the partner force, and then operating with them, and you do it in a CT capacity where you're finding, fixing, and finishing the bad guy, that's a different scale of mission sets as a Green Beret. Like being the Green Beret even prior to my ICTF experiences, breaking bread with my indigenous forces, my Afghans, and then going out and doing presence patrols or whatever that might be in CT fit, it's really different because it's deliberate targeting, it's direct action, it's a hostage rescue, and it, it could be violent. I mean, it, it could be um, a scary thing for everybody involved. And what, what I've seen a lot of people demonstrate um, throughout my time in the GWAT at war was this love for indigenous forces where there were a whole bunch of operational units that hated working with indigenous forces. But if you were going to go out every single night and you were the number one man and your Iraqi counterpart was the number two man clearing a point of domination at your six, you had to trust that guy. Yeah. And there was uh, a lot of trust building opportunity, but sometimes not. And you went into the breach point certainly not knowing what to always expect, but you had to trust the guy to your left and right. And that brotherhood carried on since the beginning of ICTF well into the future of them countering ISIS. I mean, they're, they're one of the sole ISOF units that committed and sacrificed a lot of their lives fighting ISIS in Mosul um, in and around Baghdad. So it's really cool because it perfectly comes together uh, we're going to be doing little segments of this, talking about the details specifically around the equipment. Might even do a, uh, might even do a, a gear review on the gear, on the equipment, on the painting, yeah, that'd be uh, cool. which would be really cool. That'd be really cool. Um, and it, it's cool because uh, my last Eagles and Angels uniform is a Iraqi Lithuanian soft uniform that I wore, where. Uh, we were doing a hostage rescue, and so we had to dress up like the Iraqis because they would identify that those Americans. Yeah. And we did that joint joint hit in the, in the Jaff. Well, that's going to be really cool. 
Because I so, know from working on this painting, that Lithuanian yeah. camo is super hard to get a hold of. So super that's going to be a very special. Yeah, super yeah. hard. I think uh, I have the pants, maybe. Or no, I gave the whole uniform to Eagles and Angels. That might be the last release um, of that. But I, I, I look at this and think if people only knew how much Iraqis sacrificed their, their lives. And like you said, um, they never got a rotation off. That was their life. They never got to go get a break in a uh, freedom-loving country. That was their fight. And yeah. they, they were more than willing to sacrifice it. Yeah, they're deserving of our honor yeah. and respect. And that's this painting is definitely dedicated to that. I know we're going to talk about later as well, like how this leads into um, you know very important projects that you're working on. Uh, to show them that that honor that uh, is due to them, so it's a it's a story that I'm really excited that you know we get to tell together in this painting, yeah. and then I'll, and then beyond that, uh, and on some other really cool projects, uh, to Americans to to help them like learn more about this thing that may not, they may not know enough about yet, right, and likely don't, um, and also at the same time too, I mean, there's a really important lesson about that brotherhood, right? Like if you can take people from different countries, and they can come together with different primary languages and they can bond and they can work together at, at a level of efficiency that can produce success in moments like this that are wrought with incredible risk and danger. We as communities here can certainly learn from that. Mm. You know, we can, we can look at this instance of brotherhood and find closer ties of love and friendship with each other mm. as Americans. Yeah, I love you that. know, as people who live in real like local communities too, we can find ways to work together at levels of efficiency that produce success for all Americans, that produce success for our nation. Mm. And so I think that's why this story is a tremendous uh, uh, opportunity to honor the special forces community, to honor the military community, to honor what you guys did in Iraq in general, also to specifically look at uh, like you said, like ISOF, ICTF, the sacrifices they made, still do make um, for the greater good. Uh, and, and also to sort of pull from this uh, a lesson about brotherhood that can inspire us even now in our everyday lives. Mm, I love that. Um, what's cool about this painting is it's going to create prints that we're going to be able, or that you're going to be able to sell and we're going to do a documentary that we talked about doing last year. Um, ISIS kind of affected that. So did the security of Afghanistan, because when Afghanistan popped off, they shut down approving a lot of the visas in Iraq because of um, the, the, the tension between uh, that region. But we're looking to do this film about the Iraqi counterterrorism force and all of their sacrifices in the near future and the proceeds, a percentage of the proceeds of sales from this print, which will be hand signed by me, as well as the artist, Mac, will go to that documentary and obviously supporting a small business, a better known business that's doing an amazing, I think, mission. I think it's, it's like, I like how you frame that where it's, you have to do it because there's not many people who have the talent to kind of stitch that together and to be able to storytell and to do all the things with your Green Beret background, but also with your uh, your talent in art. Um, all right, I, I think we're we're uh, going to save the rest for the Prairie Fire podcast. So I'll actually have that link below for the Prairie Fire podcast, where you can hear in detail the story behind the painting, as well as uh, how you can get your hands on this right now. So. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, appreciate thank you, Mike. I really appreciate it. And I appreciate everything you're doing with Fieldcraft Survival and everybody in your community. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, man.